right, let's get started. Welcome to the session on Kotlin for Java programmers. My name is Venkat Subramanyam. We'll talk a bit about Kotlin. We'll look at some examples, uh, see some of the motivations for using the language. So what it appeared to me was that they took Java and they decided to add all the good features you could find into the Java language. And when they got it done, they just called it Kotlin. And uh, so Kotlin is actually a pretty powerful language. And as I started looking at Kotlin and playing with it, uh, time and again, I got, got reminded about various features that are really powerful and things I like in other languages. I program in about 12 different languages. And so I'm naturally drawn towards languages, key strengths, and features. And I can relate to a lot of different features in different languages that really shine well in the case of Kotlin. Well, Kotlin is a statically typed language, which, which really is uh, saying to us that we can get a lot of quick compile time feedback. But the Kotlin compiler also is pretty powerful in terms of the feedback it provides as we are writing code. And of course, Kotlin compiles down to Java. That should be no surprise, as in Java bytecode. But it also uh, compiles down to JavaScript, if you really want to look at JavaScript. One of the things I really like about uh, Kotlin is that it's really fluent, it's elegant. Uh, it feels right when you write the code in terms of the syntax and the way that it cohesively comes together. It's, it's elegant, like I said. It, it brings, one, one of the things that really excites me is it really brings wonderful features from a lot of different languages. Uh, like I said, I program in about 12 different languages, and oftentimes, I'll enjoy a certain feature in a language, but it wouldn't have other features, which I like from other languages. It's kind of like a, a dream come true. In a way, you can think about Kotlin like a trait, where you bring a lot of different things together, and then it becomes a melting pot for you to be able to use that. So let's talk about how we can actually use this in the language. Well, as you can see, I don't use any slides. But if you want to download the code examples I'm going to show you here, you're most welcome to download them from my website. On the downloads link, you can download it anytime you want to. So let's talk about compiling Kotlin and playing with it. And what I'm going to do here is start with a fairly simple example. I'm going to just edit a file called KT, KT being the extension for Kotlin. So I'm going to just start with a little file called sample.kt. And, and I'm not going to put any ceremony here, but I'm going to compile it so a little bit of ceremony is required. So I'm going to start with a main function, as would be traditional in Java applications. I'm going to say this is args over here, and I'm going to create an array of string, let's say. And in this case, all I'm going to do is simply print line, let's go ahead and say hello, but let's make use of the arguments that is given to us. So I'll say args square bracket zero. So that's the little code I'm going to write. Well, you probably noticed already one wonderful feature here, or the lack thereof, I don't have to put semicolon. I can't tell you how happy my little pinky is already. So I don't have to put that stupid semicolon every time I turn, so I've written that little part. But how do I compile this code, and how do I use it? Well, that's where the Kotlin compiler comes in. And there are a couple of different ways to do things. So here is a Kotlin C, which is the Kotlin compiler. I'm going to compile this file called sample.kt. Well, one of the things you can actually do, which I really like, is you can include the runtime. By including the runtime, you don't have to really provide the class path to Kotlin. It gets bundled into it, which really reduces the burden on us to deploy this and use it. So all I'm going to do here is just simply compile it and produce the sample.jar file. And once I do, I can run this like Java generally. I can say class path right here, and then say sample.jar and then provide the name of the file in this case. This is going to be sample, dot, uh, sample kt. And then let's go ahead and say world here, because we want to say hello world to begin with. So that's our Kotlin program running through Java that was fairly easy. Well, if you don't want to do this, you can also do one more thing, which is to simply compile Kotlin without the runtime. And then when you run it through Java, you would have to specify where Kotlin is located. Or simply, you can use Kotlin without the C and then just run it like that as well, like you would in other languages other than Java. So those are a couple of different options. But one of my favorites, really, when it comes to languages is um, I really want to play with languages as directly as possible. And so I'm a huge fan of REPL. And Kotlin also comes up with a fairly decent REPL that you can use. I'm going to get rid of the files I just created. So at this point, all I'm going to do is simply say Kotlin, uh, in this case, just C. And that becomes the REPL that we can start right off the bat. So I can just run the code right here and experiment with it. And so that is right there, Kotlin telling us print line hello and or hi, and we can play with it just like that. 
But again, I'm a person of low ceremony. I want to do the minimum I can and, and start interacting with the language. So I'm a really big fan of writing scripts where possible. So I'm going to create a file called sample.kts, where the S stands for it's a script and not a, a full-blown class we're going to write. So I want to really create a script and play with it right here. So as you can see in this case, we're going to simply go ahead and type that code and say, you know, hello there. Without any other ceremonies, we can just go ahead and run this. So what I'm going to do here is simply say a Kotlin C again this time, but I'll type in a script and pr provide the script file so that we can directly run it as a script as well. So you don't have to really compile and play with all of those things. So there are some of the beautiful options. You want to compile it, be traditional, create a bytecode, and then put it away. You can do that. You can play with the REPL if you want to, or you can just write it as a script and play it as a script as well. That becomes really easy. So for most part, that's what I'm going to do here. Just run it as a script and play with it as we go along. So now that we have done that, let's talk a little bit about some of the real nice, interesting features. Well, I mentioned already that semicolon is optional, so you don't have to really use it. One of the things that I really like about Kotlin is uh, sensible warnings. So if you're trying to use a variable, but you haven't really used it properly, or even initialized a variable properly, you'll constantly get some warnings, which can be really uh, you know, useful to prevent errors uh, from the get-go. But like I mentioned, uh, Kotlin is a statically typed language. But one of the things that it's important to keep in mind is when it comes to the word static typing, um, I used to be really angry about static typing in the past. And the reason is, usually static typing meant you type a lot with your fingers. That was not a really good thing to do. Well, when good type inference, you can let the language do the inference for you rather than you having to really type all the detail. So in this case, I'm going to say, let's say, greet over here. And let's say this is of a type string. And then I'm going to say hello right there. And I want to just go ahead and print the greet uh, variable uh, value right now. Let's quickly take a look at what we just did. Well, this is an example of how you define types in Kotlin. Now, you probably look at this and say, gosh, this is like uh, Scala. Or you could say this is like TypeScript. This is like, well, many different languages actually do this. And this is quite different from what we do in Java. In Java, you normally say the type over here. For example, if you're doing Java, you would say a string and then greet. Well, languages like Kotlin emphasize that the name of a variable is more important than the type of the variable. So as a result, they put the name first and the type after with that kind of emphasis. So as a result in here, you specify the uh, t uh, name of the variable followed by the type. This is how you specify the type anytime you specify it. But the good news is the type is actually optional. You don't have to really provide the type. Make no mistake, this is not dynamic typing. It knows what the type is at compile time, and it knows to deal with it properly. So if you were to call a method on this, you'll get an error saying string does not have it. So if you want to take a look at what class we are dealing with, we can quickly query this and find out it's none other than the java.lang.string that we are actually using in this case. So that's an example of type inference. My recommendation is make use of type infer inference as much as you can. And, and of course, if you're writing a public-facing interface, it's a good idea to specify type information. If you're writing a local variable, for example, I would say just don't bother saying the type. Let the inferent kick in, and we can use that fairly nicely. So, but then going forward, you already saw me use the word called val a minute ago. Let's explore that for a minute. If I said val, let's say, uh, you know, let's say number is equal to 4, and I want to print the value of number, I can do that readily with a type inference kicking in right there. But on the other hand, if I said number is equal to just for again, you will notice I get a compilation error because val means it's immutable. I cannot assign it to the left-hand side of an expression or assignment. So as a result, I cannot modify the variable. It's an immutable variable. But having said that, Kotlin also has yet another keyword. And this keyword is called var, which is also known as the keyword of shame. So if you're going to use this keyword, you have to hang your head low and not, don't make eye contact with the fellow developers. So the point really is we are creating a mutable variable. 
which is okay in a limited situation, but not too broadly. But this really is a way to really examine the code and say, where am I using val compared to var maybe? And I can find out very quickly. But in this case, as you can see, I can modify the variables. And then, of course, if I modify the variable, I get a new value assigned to it. That's perfectly fine. But on the other hand, what happens if I try to put a string into this? Well, of course, in this case, you can see I get an error type mismatch because this was inferred to be an integer, of course. And as a result, you cannot assign some other type to it. So the type safety still kicks in fairly well, as we can see. One of the things you can do is a nice little string uh, uh, manipulations and string templates. If you're used to Groovy, the syntax here is pretty much very similar to Groovy in this context. So as you can see, some of these are kind of like in, in a language like TypeScript and uh, Scala. Then there are some features which are kind of like in Groovy. So in the case of a multi-line string, there are quite a few interesting things you can do. For example, suppose I had a name, let's say, is equal to, let's say, Bob over here. And I want to really print out, hello, Bob. I could say, hello, for example, and then simply put the name right here. And as a result, you can see that it says, hello, Bob. You don't have to have the ceremony of the curly braces, but I would encourage you to put that in if you have some other expressions. Then, of course, you want to put a curlies around it to say what is the boundary of that expression itself. On the same note, you can also define what are called multi-line strings. You don't have to endure the pain of saying plus, 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 and keep adding things. So you can very readily create multi-line strings without really putting too much effort into it. So to create a multi-line string, very simply what you can do is, it's, it's really fairly low ceremony. For example, you can say message is equal to, and just put uh, three triple uh, quotes right here. And then I start writing whatever string you want to say. For example, this is a message. And we'll just put a little a next line over here and say, uh, uh, let's say, written on. Uh, and then we could say, uh, and sent to. Well, you could also have, in this case, uh, variable names as well. And then you can put more stuff into it. So in this case, of course, I have a little name as a variable. So we'll go ahead and say name equal to Bob again. Well, if we go ahead and print the message, you can see that the message is going to be the string we created. But of course, we got little indentation going for us. What if I don't want that indentation? Well, if you don't want the indentation, you can put a little vertical bar. This feature is very similar to what Scala provides. You put a vertical bar, and then you can come down here and say, you can say trim margin, and then you can simply ask it to trim the margin that you have in there. But you say, wait a minute, what if I don't want the margin to be a vertical bar? Well, you can customize that by providing the character you're going to use for the vertical bar. So in this case, of course, you can see you can provide an argument. But if you really wanted to, you could also provide a different argument if that is the you know, symbol you're using to indicate that it's the start of this. Obviously, in this case, you would go back and use the tilde to indicate that that's actually the one that you're using as a margin separator. So that's an example of creating a multi-line string. But one other thing that really catches my attention is when languages treat things in a nice little way, well, one of the things we have learned over time is think about the word expression versus the word statement. I tried doing this. Say the word statement and see how grim it feels, like life was taken away. On the other hand, say the word expression, you immediately start smiling, don't you? It feels light. Well, that's why I like expressions more than statements. The reason I really don't like statements is, by definition, statements introduce mutability, how evil they are. So you cannot do anything with a statement other than causing mutability. And the more statements we have in a language, the more we force upon mutability on us. But expressions, on the other hand, do not force mutability. They actually return results back to us. So the more the merrier expressions, that's better. In a purely functional language, there are no statements. There are only expressions in a purely functional language. But of course, we are programming with a hybrid language, so it's a mixture of statements and expressions we normally have together. But when it comes to expressions, the more we have is better, like I said. So here's an example. Let's say we have age equals to 17. Now I can say uh, can vote equals, I can say if age is greater than 17, I can simply say please vote, vote over here. And then I can say else, well, we could say not so fast. So you can see in this case, I have a little expression, but this is not a statement if becomes an expression. 
As a result, whatever the if is returning can be assigned to a variable very easily. So in this case, of course, if I were to print out the value of can vote, you can see that in this case it says not so fast, which is the value that comes from the else part right here. Similar to if, a try and catch is also an expression. So whatever you do as a last statement within an, a try uh, block becomes an expression of the try itself, so that becomes easier to remove the ceremony and also prevents unnecessary mutability and garbage variables in the code as well. So in general, the code becomes a little bit more concise the more expressions we have, and Kotlin is leaning towards in the right direction in, in that sense. Let's talk about functions, though. Uh, well, functions, how do we create functions? Well, you know, we all program about maybe 8 to 12 hours a day, so Kotlin wants us to remember to have some fun along the way. That's why they call it fun. So every time you want to create a function, you call it fun. Well, that's exactly what Erlang uses as well. So you are normally use fun to define functions in these languages like Erlang and Kotlin. So what you do in this case is you say fun, and then you could say greet over here, and then I'm going to specify a name, let's say a string, and then I'll specify a message, let's say, in this case, also a string. And then we will go ahead and just print out a result out of this. Well, before we go uh, uh, through this, let's put an equals right now. And we will say, in this case, message over here, and then a dollar name. Well, notice what I just did here. I wrote a function called greet. Greet takes name and uh, message as arguments. I specify the type of the arguments, but I put an equals. The equals is a fairly limited capability in Kotlin, but the equals says, please do type inference for me and figure out what the return type of this function is. Like I said, this is very limited capability, so this only works for very small function, usually a single line function. This works really well. If it's a little bit more complicated, you would have to do a little bit more work uh, for this. But in this case, I can go ahead and call the greet method, and I can say over here, for example, j in comma, let's go ahead and say hello, and you can see that in this case, we are calling the greet, which is returning the hello j in, and we are printing printing the result out of it. So this is an example of t using type inference while we are writing a method itself. But you can also specify the type if you really wanted to. So you could say qu uh, colon string, as you can see here, and then you would put a curly right after that, and then you can implement the method you want to implement right in here. So for example, in this case, I'm going to say a dollar message, let's say, and then dollar name. And in this, uh, of course, I'll call greet one more time, and we will just pass the, to this function an object of Jane for the first parameter, and let's say hello for the second one, and this time we wrote it as a separate method. But in this case, it's returning a string, isn't it? So it tells us we are supposed to return some result from this. Right there, the type checking kind of came and said you need to return some value. So I'm going to put a return statement right now, and then return that particular value from that particular call. Well, in this case, of course, I'm going to go back and print the result at this time, and you can see that it is going to print the result of that particular call. But what if I want to write a void method? I'm not interested in returning any result from it. Well, in that case, of course, let's go ahead and move the print line again over here. And of course, for this one, I'm going to make this a void method. If you want to really make it a void method, you could type unit, but I would just leave it out. Why bother about the ceremony? And you can just write it as a void method, just like that, uh, not bothering about the unit. But unit is just the representation of the void in uh, language like Scala and, and Kotlin. So right there's a function we wrote pretty nicely. Well, so we wrote a function. We looked at the return type inference. We talked about uh, specifying the return type. We talked about the uh, return in a void method as well. But here comes a charm. I'm a big fan of default arguments. I'm used to default arguments from languages like C++ and TypeScript and uh, all the way to Scala. Well, why, why do I care about default uh, arguments? People will tell you default arguments are really nice because you don't have to send an extra argument. I don't buy that. That's not the reason I like default arguments. The reason I like default arguments is it's a nice way to evolve an API. So if I already have a function with, let's say, two arguments, but I realize I want to add a third argument, by making it a default, it becomes a nice way to transition. Existing code can still work. At the same time, I can add new properties and parameters to this function very easily. That's one of the reasons I really like default arguments. So in this case, I'm going to provide a default argument, let's say, in here. I'm going to call greet and pass Jerry to this. 
but I'm not sending the second argument as you can see. Now when I run this code, it will fail obviously because I need to pass an extra argument. But I'm going to give a default value to this. So I'm going to say equal to high right there. So we are providing a second argument to this function, as you can see in this example. So given the second argument, I don't have to really pass an argument for the second argument. It just simply takes a high. But one of the other things you will notice in here is, this is again a feature available in modern JavaScript. In ES6, you have default arguments. But in ES6, default arguments can refer to other arguments, other parameters in your function. Kotlin provides that capability also. So I can come in here, for example, and knowing that name is already ahead of this, I can say name.length, for example, over here. And as a result, when I run it, it actually doesn't say hi, Jerry. It says hi, fi, Jerry. So I can do that as well by combining this. Jerry is very happy, as you can see. So we can just put these arguments and use the parameters earlier in the parameter list as well. So again, this is a feature I've seen in JavaScript. You can do this in Kotlin as well uh, pretty nicely. So you can use default arguments. You can tie these to this. But going a little forward, one of the things that gets really hairy is when your arguments become uh, uh, you know, relatively large, when you have multiple arguments, it can become really painful. So what you can do instead of working with it this way is you can simply call greet, but you can say name is equal to, in this case, we'll say uh, Sarah for a minute. And then we can also specify the argument value message is equal to, and they don't have to be in the same order, obviously. And I can say howdy, for example, and pass it in. So you can start giving these values as named arguments as well. But of course, you can also mix them together if you really wanted to. So you can pretty much rewrite this as greet, but you can then send Sarah right here. And then you can also say name equals to uh, you know, hello, for example. And so you can also have positional arguments, followed by, of course, you can also provide the uh, values for the other arguments too. And in this case, of course, we are sending the message. So if you have multiple arguments, you can choose to send some positionally, as long as you keep the order, and send others using the names also. So it gives you all these combination of uh, flexibilities. Some of you may recognize those capabilities from Groovy as well. So Kotlin brings that really nicely in here with, with the fairly good uh, type checking. So that's basically about named arguments and how you can use them in, in here, and you can mix them together. One of the other things, of course, is we really want to use nice uh, variable number of arguments. So in this case, I'm going to create a max over here. We'll call it as numbers, if you will. And this is going to be a type integer. However, I'm going to say var args on this. So var args allows me to pass multiple arguments to this particular function. So in this case, what am I going to do? I'm going to leverage type inference for a minute. And another thing I'm going to do here is to simply say numbers.reduce. And I'm going to take a max value and an element given to me. And I'm going to simply return if max is greater than element, simply return max, otherwise return element for me. So that becomes a nice little cute little function for getting the max. And I'm using the reduce function here to get the data out of this and return to it. Well, this is a lambda expression, so I'm going to put a little curly on this. So lambdas can appear as a curly outside or within a parenthesis, if you want to put it. But the curly is always required in Kotlin. So if you're going to write a lambda, it always requires the curly. So you could wrap another parenthesis around this, which is kind of wasteful. So what I can do now is I can call the max function, oh, maybe let's with, with 1 and 2 to get us the result of 2 in this particular case. But I can also call print line max this time. And I can say 8, let's say 7, 3, 9, and 4. And I can get that value out also as a value of 9. But what if I really have an array already with me? So let's say in this case I have values equals, uh, let's say int array of, and in this case, let's say 4, 5, and uh, you know, let's say 23 and uh, 2. Well, I want to pass this over to max. And, and get the response for these values. But of course, in this case, if I say values right here, 
what's going to happen in this case is we get an error type mismatch because I cannot pass to this obviously an int array when a var arg is expected. So what am I going to do to fix this? Well, the beauty of this is the spread operator, which we can use very nicely. Or some languages call it as explode operator. Well, in fact, we can just not only use that, we can combine it with other operations also. So in this case, I say one, two, three, for example, and then I'm going to explode our spread values. And then I'm going to say, let's say, again, you know, nine and, uh, and a two. Well, now, of course, when I run it, the values contains the biggest value in this collection. So as a result, it brings back 23. So you can combine these together. So you can have a combination of discrete values, and you can spread or explode your value also, and then combine things together. So that becomes really nice to start programming. We're not spending our time on ceremonies. It just becomes natural once we learn some of these syntax available to us. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the traditional for loops, but that again becomes a little bit easier to work with in the language. How about writing a little for loop to play with this? So I'm going to say for x is going to come from 1 to 10, and then in this case, I'm going to simply print the value of x. Keep in mind, in this case, it includes the value x over here. This is something I've learned in Ruby, and I really like this syntax. But unfortunately, in Ruby, if you want to include a value and don't want to include a value, you put two dots and three dots. And that is called cruelty, right? Because a programmer is going to like look at this and say, is it two dots or three dots? And as I'm getting older, that's not really helping me. Well, so Kotlin said, you know what? We're going to just use a two dots to give you a range. But if you really don't want to include the value, we'll just make it a little easy for you. So we're going to say for uh, uh, you know x in 1, until 10, well, that doesn't include the value 10, as you can see. So if you don't want to include, if it's not inclusive, uh, then use until. If it's inclusive, then you can use the two dots to get to it. What about uh, stepping through some values in the collection? Well, if we want to step through the values in the collection, you can say step two, for example. And then, of course, you can just skip some values and go through it. You can also do a step down if you wanted to. So in this case, for example, you can say uh, 10. And then you could say, for instance, down uh, 2, oh, let's say 1. And we can go from 10 all the way down to 1, and we can do that. And of course, you're thinking, what if I really want to skip values doing it? Now I say step. And obviously, the confusion is, is it 2 or minus 2? Well, OK, it's actually 2. If you do a minus, you get a compilation error. So you can skip values as you drop down as well. You're just positively decrementing in the direction of uh, decrementing. So that's an example of very nice, elegant loops as well that you could use. But of course, you can also iterate over uh, values also very easily. So for example, let's say we have a collection of names on our hand. So I'm going to say val names is equal to, let's go ahead and say, in this case, list of. And we'll, we'll call it as uh, Tom, let's say, uh, and a couple of different values. Here's our Jerry. And uh, one more, maybe, we'll just include uh, Spike. So I want to iterate through these values. So we can simply say for name in names. And then we can start iterating through the name and print the value out uh, very easily as we go through this. Well, that's great, but what if I really want the index value given to us in this, in this case? Well, we can also get the index value. We can say index, and then we can say name.indices, and then we can get the value, the index value, through it, so we can start putting counts on it as well. But of course, in this case, because we have these string expressions we can use, we can take the index value, and then if we chose to, we can also say names square bracket, let's say the index, and get the value out of the collection as well. In this case, a get, of course. So we can get the value of the index also uh, fairly easily and process that if we really wanted to. So again, very elegant and a co a cohesive and fluent syntax for four. So whether you choose a functional style of programming or whether you choose a imperative style of programming, you got it covered. So you can enjoy the fluency in both cases fairly well. And, and, and that's what Kotlin does. I do have to mention that Kotlin does have a few rough edges. There are a few times I would get annoyed with it because when I'm trying to write the code, if I deviate slightly from the syntax, I would not get an error, but it would give me, a, a, in return, a lambda expression at, at times, which is not what quite I was expecting. So there are a few rough edges, and hopefully over time, that will get really uh, streamlined and, and uh, taken care. So, but one thing I really enjoy, so one of the things I, I do is, 
is um, I'm a big fan of uh, beauty in languages. That's what I spend my nights on, uh, playing with different beautiful things on languages. And, and so I, was, I remember very clearly about uh, maybe a two years ago, I had in front of me a Ruby code, and they say Ruby is elegant and beautiful, so to a great extent it is. But I was looking at the Ruby code, and in front of me was an if statement, which was about 10 lines of code. And, and you never can go to bed when you have an ugly code in front of you. And I sat there and I was started Googling, started reading, started searching. And then I came to, I, I said to myself, there's got to be a better way to do this, right? And then eventually I stumbled on this beautiful class in Ruby called the when class. And I just dearly loved it. And I was so thrilled to see when actually in um, uh, Kotlin as well. So when is actually a very beautiful pattern matching syntax. It can remove a lot of ceremony in your code. And I think I've done it fairly elegantly here as well. Let's take a look at one example here. So I want to create a function called process, but it's going to take an input. I don't know what the type of the input is. So you can say the type is any in this case. And then I'm going to say over here when, and I'm going to put the input on it and put a when block around it. Now I'm going to go ahead and call this process over here. And I'm going to, when I call the process, I'm going to send a value of one. So I'm going to put a one right here. And I'm going to simply print, uh, you uh, got one. And in this example, as you can see, when I call the process, it simply said, you got one. So I can certainly do that. I can also call process, and I can send a seven. I can call process, and I can send, let's say, an eight. But I want to know that if it's one of these two values. So I can come in here and say seven comma eight. And then, of course, this says uh, uh, you got a seven or eight. So we can start putting these little combination of values very nicely. But what if I really want to pro send, uh, let's say, a value of 16? Well, I can come down here and say in and 12 to six, um, well, 19, I can simply say over here, I can print maybe teen. So I can do that as well to check the range of values pretty nicely. So if your value that you're looking for is supposed to be within a range of values of a collection, you can just put that and see if it's in the collection also uh, fairly easily. You can do what else and you can say, uh, you know, in this case, whatever that you gave me. And of course, if you send me something that I don't understand what it is, I'm just simply going to say whatever. So in this case, let's say string builder. And you can see that in this case, it simply is going to bounce back with a whatever. Well, you can start putting these different combinations. But one of the other things you can do here also is you can check for types if you really wanted to. So you can say is a string. And then, of course, I can print over here, uh, you, uh, you got, let's say, you got. And then we'll just print out the string we have, in this case, input. Well, let's kind of give this a try. So we'll go ahead and call process. But we'll send to it, let's say, the string hello. But you can see that in this case, because it's a type string, it says, you got hello. Well, but on the other hand, here comes a charm. If I go up here and say input.length, I get a compilation error because length is not a valid method on any. So I cannot use int.length. However, the language, again, avoids ceremony. When you step into right here, where the cursor is, you already have proven that input is a string. So it doesn't punish you. It doesn't ask you to pay a toll. You can simply come here and say input.length and be done with it. That's a really beautiful auto casting. As a result, you're not wasting your time doing stupid casting. The language is intelligent. You program with the language like it's an adult, right? That's one of the things I really like about it. Rather than treating it like a, a child and you have to keep saying, now that you transformed it, now you've got to cast it, you don't have to do that. That kind of uh, uh, you know, uh, things remove the ceremony again from the code and make it very fluent and convenient, so there's a really nice automatic casting. Similarly, if you had a done a if st statement to check if it's something is null, automatically it will cast over for that as well. Well, moving a little forward from here, we also have a null type, which is really pretty cool. Null types are going to tell us whether a value could be null or not. For example, if I have a nickname over here, and I want to take a name and return a nickname for this person, and I'm going to say a string over here, but in this case, I'm going to say if name is equal to, oh, let's say in this case, uh, uh, Robert, I'm going to return in this uh, example, let's say, uh, Bob. But what about if there is uh, no nickname? I'm going to simply return an empty string for now. 
So if I print out a nickname over here and pass Robert over here, you can see that in this case, I'm gonna get back the result of Bob, but what if I print name and send a nickname? Thankfully, Venkat doesn't have a nickname. Well, in this case, of course, it doesn't really return anything. But I really want to say that don't even bother giving a nickname for Venkat. So what do I do? I'm going to return a blunt null. But we know that null is not very pleasant. Well, as a result, the code refuses to compile, saying, don't you dare do that. You cannot return null anywhere you want to. Well, this is one of the things from C-sharp. Uh, C-sharp has nullable types, and we can make use of that here in Kotlin very elegantly. So if you really think that you are going to return a null, then put a little question after the type. That becomes a nullable type, and as a result, you can return null values now. Similarly, when you receive a data, you can receive a nullable type as well from the call, and then you can perform a check on the null. But there's some really elegant syntax for checking as well. So what you can do is if you have a nullable type on your hand, whatever the variable name is, we'll call it name, you can put a question colon like this, and this will be the part for if the value exists. And then you can also put a little uh, you know, a question colon for the part where the value does not exist. So you can write the syntax very elegantly to process that as well. And again, you will enjoy the auto casting I mentioned earlier. Once you go through the check, you can then readily use the type as a regular type, not as a nullable type. That becomes really, really powerful. Well, what about creating functional style code? Well, we can definitely create lambdas and play with them uh, in here as much as in any other language. So for example, I'm going to create a little lambda right here called double. This lambda is going to take an argument, let's say, uh, element e. Because I'm writing, writing this standalone, I do have to specify the type, kind of like in Java. So in this case, I'm going to return an e times uh, 2. That becomes my little lambda expression I'm creating. Now I can say list of, and let's say 1, 2, 3, a few different values I want to work with. So what I can do in this case is I can then take this and say filter. And to this, I can say given an element, element mod 2 is equal to 0. I can get the elements which are, uh, in this case, of course, the uh, even numbers. Then I can perform a map operation, and I can just pass the double over to this. And then finally, a for each method. And if you remember, Java has a method called peak. Well, here they have a method called uh, you know, each, where you can say or each, and then you can just peek into that variable as well. So you can have a combination of these methods that are available to you. Well, in this case, of course, I want to print this value out. So how am I going to print it? Well, I can say, given an element, I want to print the element. So I'm going to take all the even numbers, double the even numbers, and print them. Or if you don't want to really give a silly name to it, you can simply say print line it. And it is a legitimate variable like in Groovy that you can use for lambdas as well. So you don't have to really give a name if it's a single variable. You can just use the it. Uh, Cotton also has a destructuring of lambda parameters as well. So if you're receiving multiple parameters, you can easily set them into uh, you know, different values much more easily. Let's talk a little bit about extension methods. This is something I really enjoyed in C Sharp. And you have beautiful extension methods here, too. So for example, I'm going to say a, value, a function called shout. And I want to create this function whose name is shout. Well, in this case, we'll come back to this in just a minute. But I want to go ahead and take a string. So I'm going to say greet is equal to hello. But I want to call greet.shout, let's say. But we know that shout does not exist on the object. So as a result, I'll get a compilation error right now. So it doesn't know what shout is. But I go back over here and say, well, this is on the string class. So string.shout. And then I'm going to simply take this one and say, well, let's make it easier. We'll just simply return to uppercase and ask it to return with the type inference and such. So now when I run this code, you can see it is going to convert it to an uppercase and give it to us. Be very careful, though, while this is a very convenient feature, you need to remember that this is not literally adding it to the class. This is more of a compiler gimmick. So what the compiler does is, anytime it sees the word uh, uh, greet.shout, it rewires the call site right here. So as a result, if you have an overloaded method, that would not work properly. So in other words, extension methods cannot be overloaded. Uh, it is simply just for you to conveniently call into it. So there are certain limitations you have to be uh, fairly comfortable with when you use this. 
Let's talk quickly about classes a little bit and see what we can do. Well, classes are final when you begin to create them. Classes can have properties. These are very much like your C-sharp properties. You don't have to define fields. They automatically get defined for you, which is really nice. So you can focus on the fields rather than, uh, fo focus on the properties rather than writing fields. But what if I really want to do something with a field, period, you cannot define fields in Kotlin. However, you can refer to them. You don't define them, but you refer to them. And you can refer to them using a name called field. And of course, you can also set the setters as uh, private as well. Let's take a quick look at an example. So class car over here, and I'm going to define a property called year of registration. And then I'm going to say, in this case, is equal to 2010. This appears like a variable uh, field, but it's actually a property. How do I create an object right now? Car equals to car. There's no new keyword in Kotlin. So, um, so uh, there's, a, there's really a parenthesis to really invoke it. So you can treat classes like they are functions, if you will, to create objects of this. Now I want to print out right here car.year of registration. And you can see that in this case, we are pulling in the property. But of course, if you want to do some checking, you can certainly do this. So you can say set value, which is going to be a function I'm going to create right here. And what am I going to do within the function? I'm going to say if the value is greater than 2017, I'm going to say throw runtime exception. And in this case, I'm going to specify uh, not in the future, right? So you can specify a little exception. Otherwise, what am I going to do? Field is equal to the value that you provided for me. So we can start setting things very easily by these kinds of uh, functions, and you can write a setter for that. But on the other hand, if I try to modify this and say, uh, well, let's do this before we print it out. So car.year of registration is 2016. And you can see that in this case, it does not uh, prevent me from changing. But if I try to set it to 2019, I get an exception on it because I can't really change it. So you can write setters for it. And notice this is called field. You don't really get access to the direct field. Again, very similar to what C Sharp does. But Kotlin, I think, does it a little bit more elegantly by using this thing called field, whereas C Sharp requires an actual name at that point. So that's really uh, nice over here. You can also write a getter similarly. So if I want to really bind this to yet another field, I can write another getter for this and get that field through this particular variable. So that works out really nicely. But keep in mind one thing, though, that when you create classes, uh, classes are uh, uh, final to begin with. You cannot inherit from them. So you have to open them if you want to inherit. What about static methods, though? So I'm going to say object. This is very much, if you know Scala, you're in home here with this. So object util, and I'm going to define a function called get, let's say, number of cores over here. And this number, of course, is going to return to us, let's say in this case, because I'm going to just return the value. Let's just return a value of 4, let's say. Well, I can call the util over here and call the get number, of course, method right directly here. That's a static method on this particular class. But if I'm creating an object, what do I do? Well, in this case, I'm going to say class car right here. But this is going to be defined as a car, a class. So this is a class, as we can see. We can write a function within here. For example, I'll say if a, fun, a fun drive, let's say. And the drive function is an instance method, as we would know. So I'm going to simply say driving. Well, this clearly requires an object to be used. So I can say car equals to car and create an object. In this case, of course, I can call the car.drive very easily. But what if I want a static method on this class? Well, in this case, of course, if I want a static method on the class, I can simply say car. You know, some kind of a static method, you know, the kind, for example. Well, but the kind doesn't exist on the car right now. How do I define a static method? If I want to define a static method, once again, I'm going to come in here and say companion. And then this becomes an object. And then within the companion object, uh, you can provide your kind method. So fun, and then this is going to be kind. And let's just go ahead and print out, in this case, a uh, kind called. So um, you can see how that becomes available as a companion object on the class. You can also provide a name for your companion class also. If you say car kind, for example, what is the difference? Not nothing at this moment. But if you want to get an access to this car kind, how do you do this? Well, if you want to get access to it, you can say, for example, uh, you know, uh, 
let's call this as ref is equal to, well, car dot, and I can say companion over here, and that's a way for you to get access to the companion of that particular car. But on the other hand, if I were to go here and call this as a car kind in this case, then no longer can you call it as a companion. You would have to call it as a car kind if you get, give it a really uh, you know, specific name. So there are different ways to get access to this particular companion object as well, and you can use it. And, and one real uh, uh, detail, if you want to really use your uh, object as a data object, Maybe all you're doing is just pass data around, not very much behavior. You can say data class, and then that just becomes an immutable class. You can make a copy of it, provides a few free methods like toString. You can also access properties directly or using something called component n and get access to it also. And finally, about inheritance, I quickly want to say that you have to open classes before you can inherit it. But I want to talk about two very interesting features before we are done in the next six minutes. So I want to show you a little bit about laziness. So laziness is a pretty phenomenal feature. I really like it. So to understand this, let's say we have a method called compute. The method compute takes a value integer. And all I'm going to do within this method is simply return that integer. So I'll just return back the given value n, let's say. But what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to simply print out, let's say, and this is going to say over here, a uh, called. Well, you know one thing very clearly. If I were to say x is equal to 4, and if I say if x is greater than 5, and if I say compute of, let's say, 4 is greater than 7, I want to go ahead and print out, let's say, result. Well, you know one thing very well. When I run this code, it is not going to print the result. Well, that's great. But what is it going to do, though? It's not also going to call the compute method, after all, because the compute method is short-circuited, which is nice, absolutely. However, if I take this one here and say temp over here, and if I say val temp is equal to that, so such a sad thing, it calls the compute method, because it doesn't know that you don't need the value of compute. Well, you can do something really elegant here. You can say val temp by lazy, and then you can use a level of indirection here and say that I want to postpone calling that until a later time. So as a result, now you can see it never actually called the compute method. However, if this becomes a 44, clearly x is greater than 5. And when you run the code now, you can see the compute is called, but not otherwise. So you can do laziness very nicely. Well, in a similar way, this is just a specialized syntax of a full-blown delegates that is available in Kotlin. A delegate simply contains a get value and a set value property, doesn't have to implement any interfaces, and it'll just delegate to the call, and you can do beautiful metaprogramming with it. Talking about metaprogramming, I want to show you two elegant features which are pretty darn cool. The first thing I want to show you here is, let's say we have a class called pizza. Now, in this case, the class pizza has a method, a function called spread, and I'm going to write an item, which is a string, let's say. Well, in this case, when I write this method, I just simply want to call here and say, oh, well, let's go ahead and say spread, and then we'll just say item. Well, I want to call this method after all, so I'll say pizza is equal to pizza, new pizza, and once I create an object of the pizza, I want to say pizza.spread, and let's say cheese. Uh, I know this is a bad example to use right before lunch. So when I run this code, you can see it called it. But you may say, but wait a minute, wouldn't it be so cool if we can do this? So let's go ahead and try that. Sadly, that doesn't work. But we can fix it by saying this is an infix operation, and we can get some beautiful, elegant syntax with it. So all you have to do is infix a single a parameter arguments can be used for it, so we can start creating some elegant code with this kind of syntax. So the final example I'll show you here is to apply this to do something a little bit bigger. What if we can do something kind of like this? What if we say operate, and then I'm going to say it turns right, and then it turns left, and then it runs fast. Wouldn't that be cool to just write something like this? Well, let's see how we can do this. Well, func uh, function operate, and the function operate, of course, is going to uh, take as an argument 
a lambda expression. Because remember, this is just a lambda. And how do I say it's a lambda? I'll say func over here. It's a lambda which doesn't return anything. We'll start with this baby steps. So operate is going to be called with that. So we'll start with that and see what it's going to do. So in this case, I'm going to call the operate and pass this to it. It doesn't have a clue what it is, but don't worry about it. We'll come to it. So I'm going to create a class called robot, and the robot is going to do all this work. So let's say we have a method called, let's just do the turns. We'll not worry about this right now. So what about turns? Let's define a function, well, infix function called turns. And let's say it's going to take uh, the uh, variable, in this case, let's say direction. But I'm going to simply call this and say, we'll simply say turns, and then we'll print the direction out here. Well, let's do one more thing. We'll just define a value called right, and the right is going to be equal to right. And then we'll define a value called left, and this is going to be left. We'll see how this is going to end up. So now that I have the infix method and the turn method, I'm going to come in here and say, this is going to take a robot as an argument and then return back a unit. Well, OK, so far, so good. We'll just go ahead and say called over here and see what it's going to do at this point. Well, when I run this code, uh, operate, let's make sure this is correct. So this is the um, operate. It does expect you to spell correctly. OK, so um, that's the method we're going to use. And what about the turns right? We'll come back to that in just a minute. So now that we have this code running, oh, it's going to call the called method. But I need to invoke this particular method and have it run, do some work. In order to do this, I'm going to come in here and say func. And then with this function, I'm going to create an object of robot. So I'll say robot is equal to robot. And I'll say robot, well, we'll say with robot. And then I can perform this function to run within that context. This is one way to do it. Cartoon also gives you a way for you to attach to this to a class also, and you can run with it. And by doing this, you can say, I want to run this code within the context of robot. And so as a result, I want to run that little code within that environment of execution. Well, what this really amounts to is you can pass a lambda expression and have that lambda execute in this context. Let's quickly take a look at the error that it's giving us. Uh, no value passed to the parameter. Well, sure enough, that's correct. We'll just pass the robot to it. So now that we have gotten to that point right here, what can we do next? Well, remember, this robot is coming in here, and we know that it refers to a special name, which is the name of the argument given to it. And as a result, what we can do here is we can start calling these kinds of methods. What about the right? Well, the right becomes a variable within this context of this object, and that should become available right here as a this dot right, and that should have actually picked it up. I'm not sure why it didn't pick it up at this moment. So in this case, it will run in that context. For now, I'll put a string, but we can, I'll leave this a homework to debug that. So when I run this code, of course, you can see that it is turning right. So you can get to this kind of fluency very nicely by playing with the language and passing lambdas around. And, and, and then as a result, using some infix uh, notations, you can gain quite a bit of fluency in this code. If you download the code I provided, you will see that I'm able to call this without the string itself, and you will be able to use it. So you can start creating quite an interesting set of fluency as well. And with all this said, I managed to create a, a cover a very small part of the language. So, but it's a really fun language. It, it's a lot of fun to play with it. If you have enjoyed other languages, I'm sure you'll enjoy Kotlin as well. If you want to download the examples, please download from my website. Hope that was useful. Thank you.